So, um, thanks for making it back. So we're now slightly late, but nevertheless starting, hopefully, and um, talking about cloud, not forensics, as advertised on the Thema plan. Um, in the first of all, assignment. I see the happy faces. That's brilliant. I don't see happy faces on the stream because they're all names. Uh, but at least I can start reading your emotions to some extent. What's the state of play right now? Is someone has someone entered emergency mode already, like panic mode, or is it only happening on Sunday night? Probably, yeah. So yeah, I went on a bit of a forensic tour, and that was through your assignments. I mean, uh, in, in part, those guys are uh, also um, scouting it. But I uh, had some had a bit of a look, and it's the the pattern of commit history was quite converging towards deadline. I mean, in the beginning, I was so you know, a bit of a sprinkle here and there, one or two commits, and then. There was a bit of a crunch time happening at the end, so I, I wouldn't expect anything less this time either. Um, but I would recommend I would have recommended you because now we're getting towards crunch time. I would have recommended you to start reasonably early because um, again we discussed already that the the basic endpoints with all the flaws that has have been now been elaborated I think in the issue tracker quite well uh, should be finishable quite quickly, and I think that gives you you know. Um, to give somewhat a passing uh, 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 you know, position, but in order to kind of have a bit of an edge on your submission, you better want to do something on the registration as well, which is a bit more, requires a bit more drawing and thinking. As I mentioned before, if you haven't reached that stage, people will don't continuously and you know, frantically implement your endpoints again when you get to the registration. Again, if you not, are not really clear about the concept of the webhooks yet, either have a look at the lecture material again or take out a pen piece of paper and redraw it out how all things tied up right because you need to design a second service as well that is the kind of the one that you're registering towards the to the first service for notification and so on nothing hard but just conceptually a bit you know a bit more uh, complex so it's just important that you get the bearings right my experience is in my experience just try to get it conceptually right first before implementing because oftentimes people say ah i did this rest stuff heaps of times now let me do it five times again no big deal right so but then you lose yourself in the complexity a bit not because you can't program it but just because you lose the big, lose the big picture uh, are there any other comments questions so far please yep. Where do you need to notify to so that there is a place that there is URL and uh, in the example it's like localhost to the client and client. Um, but are we assuming that the client is also a server? Yeah. Like so yeah, let me repeat the question. The question was uh, about the webhooks. Uh, evidently, someone has entered the implementation phase. Uh, 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 the question is there: um, um, how, how how do we deal with the you know? client that is supposedly the callee if you like that is supposedly notified and can register for a notification or that you can register right remember you can in principle register any url it's just a question of that url responds to your request right so in your in your, for your web you could just register example.org or google.com or facebook.com please don't uh, and just bombard them with notifications even though they will not be entirely receptive or your own endpoint and the answer is yes your own endpoint let me just bring up the um, the assignment very briefly just to motivate this a bit. Uh, that's precisely my, my pointing on how to share screens. There we go. I think everyone sees my screen. You guys, the stream sees them. I don't see the chat. I have my beloved um, fellow teaching team. So we have eyes on chat. You have an eye. Yeah, that's right. Good. Eyes on the ground. That's good. Um, my folk. Uh, and it's the last point you're referencing, right? You're suggesting hey, we can view all the webhooks, so we know all this. Hang on, there is something about this webhook invocation, right? And the idea is basically not about not 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 a, not much of complexity, but in principle, uh, this service needs to be able to consume the data you send it, right? So it's some endpoint, yes, another service that just bluntly consumes the data in a way. There's no expectation of sophisticated. Activity, you just need to be able to debug more or less what it receives, right? So, so you can see that it actually successfully um, um, receives uh, the response. Does it make sense? So, so does it work with another endpoint for the client? And then if you want to check the notification, can we just go and see if there is a button? Exactly. So let me just uh, bring up the, scale, um, the webhooks um, structure again, because that should exemplify it somewhat. It's literally built on this uh, 
conception. So, come on. Just show that again. All right, there you go. So, we have the server, right? That's where you spend time on right now, right? You have two points. You have the, you have the registration endpoint, then you call third party services and make your life hard by thinking about COVID-19 um, aspects and so on. And then you register some client, that guy there. Yeah. And this guy basically also as UL has also an endpoint. And here's the flexibility. You're completely free to do whatever you want there, as long as it's able to consume something effectively, right? And in the webhooks demo, there's exactly such a service you could possibly even use, app use or shape or whatever else that emulates this client. It does only one thing. It basically just prints the content it receives. So you can see that it's actually doing something. That is not part of the, uh, you know, like, um, it's, 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 it's important to prove uh, that it works, right? But um, it, it's not, you know, a core, um, um, you know, feature of the entire system, if you like, right? But you, yes, you need to have yet another service. And you need to spin them up. You also need to think about it. One thing that you'll find is, uh, and uh, this is also motivated in the webhooks demo, you need to run them, of course, if you run them locally on different ports, right? You guys are aware of network IP addresses and ports and all that business, please, yes, a bit. If not, there will be a trouble then, because you can't run two servers on the same port, I believe, right? So uh, you would need to modify this just for this test purpose, but that's easy, right? You change the URL, point to a different port, and they get notification. But if you don't quite follow what I'm saying right now, check out the webhooks demo example. Um, it's in the repository and uh, pull it and kind of see the service. There's also readme in there that describes how they're supposedly being run. So kind of to exemplify and see interaction. It's exactly that pattern here. It's actually derived from this point. Uh, you have a comment. And then it's for testing. You mean it's merely for it's testing that it actually works, right? Yeah, please. Uh, also, I have a question. So when you invoke it, do you like um, do a, uh, a some sort of HTTP method on the URL? Or do you send in data? or? Uh, yeah, it's a. It's generally. Um, it's also described in the description, I believe. It's the post, basically. Post with the uh, webhook. Uh, with with the content as as uh, yeah, I guess the payload effectively oh, and yeah. a normal pay nothing new. Like for you, you have written that n times already. Like, so um, just a normal post request. You have an endpoint you need to receive, and then you kind of what I generally would do do this: spit out the URL on the um, console, copy and paste this thing, use Postman to inject that into the uh, registration. And then just you know trigger and then see if it actually arrives. As simple as simple. So the service, the client service or the client, yeah, service itself does not need to have a facility to register itself. It merely needs to be callly. If you want to, you know, add bells and whistles, you can make that happen. So basically, up on startups registering itself with a given URL, sure, why not? Up to you. But you don't have to. That's not uh, part of the requirement at all. Because the idea is to make the client completely disconnected, right? It could be a third-party client that. You know, I mean, ideally, I should do it this way and basically cross the sign here. You guys, you know, need to register your respective other clients and see if they're actually invoked. And in fact, for the purpose of the assignment, if you want to run it, you can actually do that if, if you get the running service um, to, to kind of, um, uh, you know, register some other client and see if it actually spits out what you're expecting it to do. But no, the idea is that you provide um, this client as well. You also get a URL for this um, uh, second client if you want to. Uh, um, uh, uh, to indicate where this lives and if you want to host it, right? So on OpenStack. Uh, but I get to that. There were questions, I believe, in the chat. Are there questions in the chat? The sound is okay. Good. That's that's important. But I think that's that's the essence. Please. Um, your question related to assignment two. Uh, how can you actually like debug Go routines? <laughs> Other than breakpoints, and uh, I would not know any advanced facility that allows you to uh, do that. But is there anyone else who has that experience, that challenge already? I think actually, uh, Doug, you have something built in. Oh, really? You have a, a stack? Uh, it's like a scroll down bar menu thing that shows you all the run times, I think. Oh really? I haven't in Goland. Okay. Um, I can link. The, I can share you the resources. Yeah. What What I know is that you could do a memory dump uh, of a given uh, or a stack trace dump uh, of a given you know uh, running instance. So if you have a, a breakpoint there, for example, you set it. You can spit it out and see what the stack trace says. Um, and um, so generally, yeah, I would go with breakpoints, uh, manual debugging, or if you want to have it crude, 
uh, use uh, trim statements, of course, um, so you kind of print out statement on the console, uh, or log statements, of course. Um, but the log is always appended at the end uh, of the output, so it's maybe quite untimely. So it actually, you know, it's only uh, appended at the end of the console. Um, yeah, those would be the ways I would um, attempt to do it. For now, if anyone knows of an advanced uh, inspection utility, because I don't, I haven't seen that in, in, in Golang, unlike in, for example, Android, where it's very straightforward to kind of uh, inspect individual threats, for example, um, I haven't um, seen that for Go routines at this stage. That's a good worthwhile investigation. Perhaps post an issue on this one, and then we can all kind of look and source and see if we find some good results on this, um, because it's, of course, a relevant um, concern. Um, other comments, questions? Oh, that is somewhat clear. So um, we're still stuck on one problem that prevents everyone from uh, finishing the assignment. And um, by the way, by Wednesday, we'll probably have some feedback on your old, old assignment. So we have a decent overview already, but I don't want to feel um, it's a bit premature to make a um, kind of clear assessment at this stage. But um, once we're done, we'll, we'll share, of course, with you. Looks overall quite favorably, in fact. Um, but what I wanted to get at today is actually thinking about how we deploy um, uh, the software, right? So, and I talked about OpenStack as being one instance. Has anyone attempted to start one instance yet on OpenStack? No is an answer, and yes is one. It's a kind of Boolean thing, it's like a closed thing. Oh. All right, okay, that's honest. Good. All right, let's um, let me just briefly motivate OpenStack quite a tiny bit because it's still an IIS solution in the end. Um, and just to um, uh, think about IIS again, what were the core aspects that an IIS system does? IAS, there you go, infrastructure as a service. First example, what does it, uh, for question and exam, what does it stand for? Um, but uh, what, what were the key features of an IAS system? In terms of, uh, yeah, so it offers flexibility, but what do we do in IAS system? What is it technologically doing? What, what does, well, IAS stands for infrastructure as a service, right? So what kind of infrastructure do we model? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like a network of computer service. Network, yeah, what else? We do network, there was something else. Yeah, but you had kind of stated everything, but I want to be. Services? AI services, someone a little bit higher? So we have, what do we emulate in an IIS setting? Network, what else? Think operating systems. Of course, not the operating systems. Because I was always asked, one of the questions in operations is always, what are the core ingredients of a computer, right? Remember that? And that's kind of thinking you want to have here as well, because it kind of disassembles it. So we have network. Like network storage. Storage, storage. Yeah, network storage and what? Yes, exactly. Those are main three ones usually. Memory, of course, comes you know somewhere in the mix. I'm not sure why they're not calling this out. You, I guess because it's usually linked to the processing, I guess, to some extent. And uh, storage is always means uh, uh, you know, hard to equivalent, like persistent storage in the wider sense, doesn't necessarily need to be persistent all the time. But those are three main concepts that are generally considered when we talk about um, an IIS solution, right? And where there are various ones, we talked about big three, at least out from the outside perspective. Um, probably should also give you a bit of an inside perspective. Hopefully you can do that after the break, unfortunately, uh, only uh, because right now you're likely to be too focused on your assignment and not pay too now, enough attention to go deep in any of those aspects. But I want to show you an infrastructure we actually have here and that we can actually use uh, and uh, as an example. And one of them is simply OpenStack. Uh, it's open source, uh, hosted here by us in uh, NTU. And uh, it kind of the idea is um, it's good to know about this architecture a bit. I mean, that, this is you know software that you can download and deploy yourself wherever you want, right? NTU has various instances, but we have one here hosted by the Department of Information Security that we are uh, gracefully allowed to use. And um, the interesting thing that I want to get across here is how does the prototypical infrastructure look like of such a system, right? So because we've talked about processing, storage, and networking as the key ingredients, and uh, 
uh, how is that wrapped up effectively? And this is kind of the original, it's not the current latest version uh, of, of OpenStack, but nevertheless, uh, an earlier version um, that highlights quite nicely already kind of the different features that such a system needs to have, right? So usually it's kind of hidden under some sort of dashboard that you know allows you to click around, do stuff, navigate things and so on, right? And then it's of course linked to an identity service that checks that you actually have the permission to do what you're doing. And if you have logged into the system, you pass those two steps already. Yeah, cool, right? So pretty much two thirds of OpenStack managed. No, yeah, not really, but in any case, you see the dashboard and this is basically linked to a wide range of different services. Again, this is a subset of the currently available services, but they're quite um, diverse in kind, but it gives you an impression how the system can be composed or decomposed. That is, there is a, uh, the, the dashboard, that is generally the, the node that ties everything up and together. Then there's various compute nodes, can be one or more. That's where the scalability comes in. You can scale this up and down by having multiple instances of those. Then uh, you have one um, node that's focused on block storage uh, mostly. So that's really like hard disk emulation, SSDs or conventional magnetic disks, whatever it actually has. But it's kind of representative of the conventional hard disk idea. And uh, then there's a networking node that is at the same time also tying up um, uh, it's not responsible for a lot of coordination inside OpenStack, but it also um, emulates an entire network infrastructure, right? So uh, separated services. So you see already how a computer or VM that runs on this level possibly is decomposed into this very uh, components and they can be selectively scaled up and down, right? By simply having more hardware. Or not. Then there's two other services um, in the prototypical one. One of them is the image service. This is largely self-serving. What does that do? Does the image serving likely do service likely do? Please. Um, like, like graphics or like UI type stuff? Not quite, but uh, you're on the right track, but closer to that, right? So they basically think about they are about um, the raw provision repositories of uh, I I disk images in the widest sense. So uh, they can, of course, contain your questions and so on. But, but the point is usually that it's like a, a set of different distributions or you know, Windows, Linux, or whatever else, from which you can pick and choose that are then instantiating. So on the right, so let me just do that here. So if you basically pick an image here from there and then compose a, com a computational system from those three ones, right? Computer network and uh, storage, of course, which is your hard disk. So kind of it will more or less is translated, of course, into block storage eventually once it's instantiated. But the raw images are held here. Think about it like a repository a bit. And then there's an object storage that's also meant to share uh, more complex uh, objects uh, in a kind of object database. Um, that the idea is there that they are usually long lasting and persistent. Um, there's a new component that is also uh, made for. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So it's kind of an object database effectively that can be shared across different instances. That's the interesting uh, idea mostly. All those left three things are generally specific to an instance, right? You wouldn't, you, you have a dedicated uh, block storage related to a, a machine and you have your networking and then there's a second instance that has all, has all that in separation more or less. But the image service and the object storage are generally, you know, more or less system wide in the widest sense. Very high level abstraction, of course, because you can model it in a way that you can you know, make, make your information more private and so on. But uh, fundamentally, the three left components relate to an instance of a VM and the right ones are more um, openly available across um, the infrastructure uh, to make it more feasible to share information as well, not just model, you know, individual isolated VMs. Okay, so that's basically the, um, so, so um, you know, under the hood, of course, if you were to look at it, here's now a bit called out by, uh, different components. We have the controller node, which is the key. So OpenStack has a bit of a centrality challenge, also scalability in that respect, because this node, the controller node, needs to be powerful enough because that's basically tying all up all the other flexibly composed nodes. And um, this has a lot of services. And the services are mostly um, used to, um, you know, provide OpenStack itself more or less, not so much computing power on the individual nodes. So it has like a the SQL database service that can be used and shared message queuing to signal uh, between different nodes and instances within um, uh, OpenStack. Then there's the network time service that allows us to synchronize time across all instances. So it has those kind of server 
uh, functionality that uh, uh, looks at the system integrity, identity service, image service is linked there, and then the whole management business. So where you have the managing compute power and the allocation of resources to individual VMs, uh, as well as and the same for networking, right? There's a networking node that is really just emulating the network stack in a wider sense. If you look at it, there's a uh, emulation of a um, yeah, layer two, layer two, three networking, if so I get it right, and so on. Um, and basically allows you to kind of uh, build concepts such as you know, um, um, uh, routers and um, subnets and so on. So basically you can emulate all this using the network load. The compute nodes then heavily rely on the idea of virtualization um, by having a hypervisor. We'll talk about this after the break. Um, set up effectively that literally runs uh, your VM more or less, which is composed based on the images and draws on block storage uh, information. So it's then um, flexibly linked with um, block storage services hosted on the block storage node. But as you see, it's called nodes already, those two ones. So those are kind of scalable. You can have an arbitrary number of them, right? Multiple compute nodes, multiple block storage nodes, whereas the controller node, at least as far as my latest knowledge of OpenStack goes, is always one central controller, right? And the object storage also, if it's needed, um, is um, expendable uh, as well. Has grown over time. More service for uh, more more um, features for containerization has been built into the system. But fundamentally, there are certain aspects of a system that are coordinating all the activity, and other aspects that are inherently scalable. So you can't just multiply all that stuff. Certain nodes can't be multiplied, um, but or uh, extended, but others um, can. So you kind of see the scalability to some extent. So um, just to scare everyone a bit. Um, this is a simple version of it, just tying it all up, right? So you think about it like a bit of a um, individual service infrastructure. You have um, overall, of course, the internet link. Then there's Horizon. Every time you read Horizon, that is the dashboard. It's called Horizon. It's even part of the URL that you are um, accessing when you want to get to the one up open from NTNU, of course. And then there's different um, of those nodes behind, different ones of those nodes hidden behind it. Here's the Swift, the object storage that you know, can can navigate uh, individual objects. Glance is the image um, repository, more or less. Then we have the OpenStack Compute, which has um, various functionalities, again, uh, that are linked to it. Uh, queues for the interaction. So if you, for example, need to access uh, block storage, because every compute node is, of course, linked to one or more uh, block storage nodes, because they emulate, basically, the um, underlying hard disk uh, via message, message queuing, generally, called Cinder. Um, and then there is the uh, networking service that sits separately uh, in a way, but coordinated by this horizon thing. So when it comes, so the point is when I want to get it here, okay, now we break everything. If you think about your, your, your average um, the compute instance, basically, you see already how it's broken down into all those different services and has something to do with more or less all of them, right? Um, that's, that's the main point, but it's all integrated under the dashboard and you see that there's a lot of different APIs because all of those expose their own APIs that you can invoke and use and possibly reuse externally and so on. Um, and that's where the kind of the mess starts a bit. So the complexity of the system is very, very high. But you see something else which I find always interesting as well, bring it up to some extent, is um, we talked a bit about the lack of standardization in cloud services. And is there anything that anyone spots that is uh, of um, you know, worthwhile noting? absent prior knowledge about all this and absent any sort of deeper engagement. Please. Uh, I mean, the only thing I can see is that, for example, the Cinder API, there's some things inside of it that act directly with some other things inside of the uh, compute API, or the, the, yeah, the compute API without accessing the API itself, but directly some things in it. Yeah. So it sort of it doesn't have the loose coupling. Yeah. So that that's one aspect. That's right. So it it turns out that particular block storage and compute, and that's what you are referring to, are quite tightly linked, right? So uh, and uh, the argument, um, while I don't know the official answer, I suspect it's based uh, to to facilitate highest possible performance, of course, right? So a dedicated message queuing pattern um, that's uh, instantiated between those two ones. Yep. That's good. What's the other aspect that's kind of interesting? Or perhaps interesting, or not interesting but notable. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it's weird that there's like two pointers to the APIs. 
the, the, the red one and the black one, which is sort of like... I don't quite understand. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me clarify this. Very good point. So um, now the idea is there um, that um, the, the very good, very good comment you're making. So on the one hand, there's Horizon. Horizon is more or less the dashboard that you use for management, right? So you spin up an instance, bring it down, change its network association, its uh, IP address, you name it, right? So we instantiate it, whatever, I don't know. Um, the other thing is that those are all APIs that are accessible more or less directly onto uh, that can directly access OpenStack components. So you can actually do API calls uh, directly to OpenStack and spin up instances, create new networks and all that kind of stuff. So there's the support for this. Um, the, the call via Horizon means that it's just the UI embedded in there, right? So that's the interaction that you usually have when you engage in it. Uh, let me just, uh, let's see if I have this here, because in OpenStack here, this is the Horizon business, what you see already. And if you say API access, uh, it gives a bit of, there's more, of course. The documentation, by the way, is linked in the wiki, so you're free to kind of try and exploit it if you want. But it actually shows all the different endpoints that are actually, you know, made available and where they are actually available. So those are the, all the, hang on, black pointers in the image from just before um, that can directly interact with certain elements. So if you want to, for example, directly interact, for example, modify or otherwise configure networking, you can do that by calling this endpoint. If you're interested in the image service, uh, deleting, creating, whatever images can do that here. If you want to deal with the container infrastructure directly, it has uh, that service as well in the recent version, uh, then you have different endpoints for this. That's basically your point. Uh, it's all about like making your infrastructure more or less scriptable, right? So um, the kind of uh, principle of IIS. So it also means that you can access individual uh, components, not the, you don't have the you know, master API of OpenStack that you access for everything, but no, you can actually address the individual components directly. They will, of course, be authenticated and all that kind of business. So they internally will draw on other resources, but fundamentally you can do that uh, more or less out of the, um, more or less out of the box. So that's the explanation for the black arrows that you see here, right? All those API calls from there. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Thanks for bringing this up. Um, the, the aspect I want to actually draw your attention to is there is something about EC2 in there or Amazon Web Services. Did anyone spot that in the figure? And that's quite interesting. Why is that possibly interesting? Or perhaps not at all interesting, but at least let me know why. Well, it, yeah, please. Proprietary. Exactly, right? So uh, uh, Jason made the point, it's about the whole proprietary business uh, aspect there and so on. So it's interesting, it tells you something about standardization on, uh, you know, in those infrastructures, because technically there's none, right? So there's no, I don't think it's still not an ISO standard for cloud infrastructure, for like, uh, especially uh, infrastructure as a service kind of APIs and so on. They will probably likely be eventually, or uh, there are certainly, you know, private communities, OpenStack being one of them. But the interesting is here that we have uh, somewhat a de facto standard emerging just by by use right so uh, the amazon aws ec2 api is actually their management um or is, is the containerization service by aws meaning that you know where you can spin up vms and so on and that's its own api and they basically emulate that entire api because they're saying hey you know so many people use aws let's kind of use the same api so they can quickly switch possibly between aws and our service as well right so it's an interesting interesting problem brings up a lot of challenges and questions for example should you be able to have intellectual property on apis <laughs> right you know can aws possibly prevent other people from using the kind of same api aspect right so it has been heavily contested for programming languages in java and android in particular right oracle versus uh, google uh, uh, debates around this in the context of programming languages but you could also extend this argument for uh, other apis as well right like, like REST APIs, for example. So can I, you know, have, do I have uh, uh, unique rights to my REST API and something like this? But uh, that's not the point I'm making. The other point is rather that we have a de facto convergence on certain good or bad conventions, right? So given the prominence of uh, Amazon uh, Web Services, it de facto has the power to define more or less how cloud infrastructure will likely look like in the future. Because this is one instance in this picture, the screenshot is a bit older right now, but it's just about the right level of complexity that I can still present because the modern uh, instance of, of, of um, OpenStack much, gets much more explosion style <laughs> diagram. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's various more of those references to Amazon services or other cloud vendors uh, actually appearing over time, just to you know signal that there's the interoperability. 
But bear in mind, OpenStack is fundamentally free and uh, accessible, so uh, you can download it instantly and run it yourself. It's really a nightmare bit because you need to have multiple machines, link them up, get the networking right, have to these these processing powers on the individual nodes. Kind of need to do a bit of planning. There's quite a bit of guidelines as well on how to do this, but fundamentally, it's uh, feasible. And generally, open source. Right? generally like an open source project. Generally, like an open source project, exactly. Uh, easy to access, hard to run. Right, so you need to get your hands dirty. There's quite a bit of um, community information out there as well, if you're interested. One thing I can tell you already, like really ensure that you only use the information that relates to your particular version, because um, OpenStack has changed massively over time in terms of the APIs, you know, one learns, right, and improves and so on. So get the version right. That's really important uh, um, to, to, to kind of to do this, right? And if you want to run it and test it on your own machine, uh, well, I think you can actually test it technically on your own machine. But I definitely would not recommend this unless you have something really, really juicy. Uh, just um, wait. Don't kill your laptop now. Yeah, that's also a good point. Uh, backup, right? Or as we should say, no backup, no mercy to anyone in the assignment phase and the bachelor phase later on. Um, so there is actually just bringing it up briefly, very short. Dev stack. That's literally the uh, kind of uh, um, yeah, more or less live version, if you like, for OpenStack that you can actually run on your running instance. So it will make substantive changes. You need to have uh, Linux install the stack basically, and that's where it basically starts uh, and it configures some stuff. And then it's actually just calling this thing. But then the rest happens. So it basically pulls off. I mean, downloads the entire internet first, and then it kind of uh, tries to set up the little components in your machine. You better have enough RAM to do this. So I'm, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but it's actually very heavy. You see, it will install all those services, Keystone, so identification, Glance, Image Service, Nova, Processing, I think, uh, Placement, Forgot, um, Sender, Storage, Nutrient, that's the edge processing one, and the dashboard, of course, as well. So there's quite a bit of uh, um, um, magic it does. So all the servers on one machine, not recommendable, but in principle possible. And I think also quite interesting from a learning perspective, but we are not infrastructure students, or well, at least not all of them or ours, right? We have some operation students, or do we? Who's doing operation, uh, operations in information security? Right. We at least one. I'm for diversity. I hope we still have the student. They didn't, didn't, or she or didn't, didn't, didn't uh, abandon us because they are scarce. So we need to keep them. Operation is important, right? So uh, someone needs to be able to run it uh, um, advisedly and um, of high quality. So, but here's the thing: you don't need to deploy DevStack. Yes, well done. So it's actually super scary if you start it because, um, you know. Anyway, we have a known instance that we can use. Here's the URL, and it's all that stuff is posted as well on the wiki. Hopefully, you have seen it. If not, you find it on resources. It's a dedicated subsection called OpenStack. Literally having the same information there. Important thing, you need to have VPN. Same as submission system. Guess what? The submission system is, guess where that is hosted? Surprise, surprise. Uh, in OpenStack, of course. So, um, but I think that's a good, um, you know, um, security feature in the first place to, to, to avoid, you know, um, your services being unnecessarily invoked by, by the outside. So we have our own instance, basically, of, um, of that's called Sky High, basically. It actually uh, makes reference to uh, Hochschule Jervik. You go. Do you guys know your own history? Hasn't always been anything new here, right? So, and that's I think that's the, still a remaining reference. So basically, a cloud environment from um, Jervik, particular. So, um, if you log in, don't use your full email, only the prefix. Otherwise, it won't work. And there's a fairly good um, documentation attached to it. So, how does it look like when you log in? Because it was one of the ensure that everyone is somewhat on board because you kind of need, will need to use this for your assignment. Um, so I'm in a bit, yeah. So you all should likely, and yes, you have access from other courses, please check that, um, will likely only have one project here, right? So just uh, when you log in, you should see a page or something. Just check that you're logging into the project or choosing if you haven't, if it's not your default one, PROC 2005 V21. And then you are followed by your uh, username, basically. That's for this course, and that's the allocation that you that you have there. I think we have all the same allocation. Let's just see how generous that is. Today is a bit sluggish, more sluggish than usual. I don't know quite why, but you know we'll survive. So, um, and here here we really see how it actually kind of works. So, when I when I talked about 
um, the decomposition of your resources into you know elements. That's literally what you see here. So uh, you you get uh, allocated a, a certain number of compute instances. So that's merely kind of machines that you can run. So VMs you can create, and as part of this, also the number of virtual CPUs that you can distribute over those instances. Right? Guess what? If you use well, you have three virtual CPUs. If you use two of them on one instance, you have one instance less to run. Right? So very logical uh, uh, conclusion. So, but the idea is you have this uh, great flexibility or some flexibility. RAM, we have now in six gigs, I guess. Uh, we have volumes. Volume is something we're not uh, terribly concerned about because there's ample, um, oh, I shouldn't say that. 20 gigs, that's very low. Let's see, let's see how it goes. I think we will get away with this. Um, so you should be able to um, allocate, you know, a certain amount of storage. And then, so that would be the storage one, the second row, effectively volumes so for example you can attach additional volumes to your machine like think about like additional hard drives effectively right that can also be detached again from your machine so you want to have a new instance and attach an old hard drive to it for example you have the database information in there that's something you would use there then we have network um, and that's basically concepts such as floating ip security groups group rules networks ports and routers okay what are floating ips Anyone? Does anyone come across it? Use open spec or otherwise? I, I can just guess on this because this is maybe like the IPs of the lab. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the, um, there was guess basically the a piece of the LAN in wider sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's basically the uh, IPs that you can reserve off the internal LAN from NTNU, right? We'll, we'll talk about this in a second, that you can assign to yourself because they want to limit the amount of IPs you can absorb, but also a matter of accountability. Who has a particular IP? Who screwed up the entire network and who, how can we track that person down? It's also because you get really like specific IPs. The cool part is, um, you can dynamically reassign them to different instances. If you think about your machine and you kind of um, want to swap out the IP uh, quickly, that's really like super straightforward because it's kind of detached from your instance. It's not like you need to go into your Linux and kind of you know change the um, etc network config file or something like this, but it's literally done on this level and dynamically reallocates uh, it. So it's quite neat and nifty in terms of the um, uh, setup. The other aspects are security groups. What do they do? No one knows. The, the, the response was um, that, uh, that likely those were to manage um, roles, different user roles and associated permissions, right? Um, not quite, but it's interesting, but, but the analogy holds. Um, what they do, so what you're saying, uh, what, what's happening there, this is generally managing the identity service, which permissions you have on OpenStack in the first place. In the context of um, OpenStack, but also Amazon, so uh, they basically just are the firewall rules. They basically allow you to specify which ports, um, you know, a set of rules that are basically grouped that you can assign to a particular VM and say, hey, you should have access to port 22 or 8080 or 80, right? The idea is by default, you shouldn't have any uh, incoming port, as, uh, you know, all incoming requests should be blocked, basically. And that's the cool part here. The infrastructure, the IS system frames any instance you have. So you don't configure individual instances from the inside, like in Linux, and, you know, install your firewall there and configure it and have all that pain, but you just leave it as, you know, I say it with care, but you leave it somewhat raw in a wider sense, but, you know, impose uh, or attach security more or less from the outside, that is from OpenStack, um, as we'll see. So, I mean, you know, you're free to do whatever you want within instances, I would be wrong, but the idea is you manage this on, um, on your project level, as opposed to on machine level, as you would in a, you know, private LAN that you set up and you want to guard security from each, uh, or uh, separate um, in machines from each other. Okay, um, the rest is straightforward. You know, we can set up networks, we can set up ports in networks, perhaps talk about it, but we can also set routers in networks. So here's the flexibility of setting up an entire infrastructure more or less, right? So it's really the idea of composing networks and kind of use them in your, in your setting. Okay, so I first of all, give you a bit of break, I believe. Um, and um, then I'll just walk a bit through more OpenStack and kind of the setup and then homework for you will of course be to set up an instance if not work at the end of this session, perhaps the next session, um, so that you can, you know, get comfortable in actually running your own instance, because you need to have it for the assignment.
Okay, um, just a bit more on the stack, just to walk you through some of the points here, um, because you want to be comfortable um, using this, not hit rock bottom. Um, but I still encourage everyone, once they have the time, and it shouldn't take you terribly long, but just to spin up their own instances so you can see. So just um, what I just mentioned, the um, overview of the different resources that you have, that you can use as a basis to compose your individual uh, instances. So um, unlike um, AWS, Google Cloud Computing, or Microsoft Azure, Azure um, there's a limited set of services. So you'll um, have seen, if you recall the last session, that is quite a bit of different infrastructure available, but also like different services. <coughs> on uh, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud Computing, for example, Firebase in, as a Google example. But OpenStack is really narrowly focusing on infrastructure only. So there's no bells and, not many bells and whistles in any case that are available that you can use. So largely computing ring. And that makes it quite pure, but also quite good for kind of you know, getting comfortable and starting um, your journey a bit. So I click first on images here. So that's the compute node that we're having here. We have down here networking, object store. So all the kind of services that you recognize hopefully already from the um from from the earlier overview I provided but first we have looked at resources now i'm clicking at the image of the images and um, here's basically everything that glance offers in this particular instance right so it needs to be maintained by somewhere that doesn't come out of the box right it needs to be actually be uh um, um kind of pre-installed images more or less that i can then be deployed and used right and you'll see um that we have quite a Quite a range of different uh, images. So CentOS is here, um, Heroes, I don't, I've never used it, Debian is there, Fedora, um, Kali Linux, that's most likely they actually use for security, uh, for penetration tests, I think, I don't know. Um, and then there's more, it's not like super responsive, or is it my machine? Or not? Ah, press the right one. So, and then, uh, but also Windows, of course, right? So we have Ubuntu, various forms. Um, I get to which one you probably want to use uh, for your activities, uh, but there's also Windows. So if you're interested in running Windows 10, for example, 12 and so on, uh, they're all there as well. Windows Server 2019, so it's nice for exercising and trying it out. Bear in mind, though, that most of them actually don't have license keys in them. So they have an expiration of three months um, and or their evaluation version, and then they don't run anymore or you need to enter a key. Um, and you yeah so that's your constraint you can get a key in principle i think we have subscription to msdna right so microsoft's uh, developer network for academic um, they are now they call this um imagine i think right isn't it microsoft imagine or something so if you start, sign up for this one if you can for free at nternu uh you can actually get your key there if you really wanted to but anyway i think you know running a server in in OpenStack that is Windows, I mean, that can, can be done, of course, but it's not something that's ne remotely needed for our purpose. So I would uh, argue that uh, probably something you want to go for in this instance, the latest LTS from Ubuntu, because then most of what you have, what we have um, talked about in the earlier Linux sessions and you have learned in your previous um, course on, on Linux introduction will be covered there. And also it's the latest LTS version. What does LTS stand for again? You mentioned that. LTS. Least stable. <laughs> no, no, latest, long term stable. Long term support, right? Support, so, yeah, yeah. long term support version. Um, standard, uh, by standard, uh, as with many other distributions, Ubuntu has a uh, main, maintenance period, I think, from six months or something, not terribly long for the latest version, until the next one comes out. So, uh, usually come out in April and then October. So, 2004 came on April 2020, and then there was in October the 20, uh, um, 2010. Coming out there will be maintained for another few months until April, literally, where the next 2104 will come out. Ubuntu is always planned releases. Um, and uh, um, every every so now and so often, it appears every two years, um, they have an LTS release in between, which they commit to uh, maintain for five years with security patches and so on. So those are the kind of instances that you would want to use when you uh, are looking for cloud services because you want to think long haul, right? Not short term. So this one. All right. Could you find some information about those, but basically it's all for free uh, um, um, created there. So what you then also need to do eventually is to create a key pair rather earlier than later. Um, and this key pair, here's one you see uh, that I made myself, of course, um, is something that is more or less permanent. You can create a key pair here and download it. Um, let's use something that's remotely 
Info is an SSH key. And it says successfully created and asked me to download that key, right? I'm not doing this right now. I probably should. Okay, I'm a nice, nice person. I do it. But you definitely want to do it. It's .pem file. This is your private key, right? And the public key, the corresponding one, is stored on the server already. And um, the idea is there that any server that you, any instance that you create, will be a getting, will get a selected key injected. So once you have then a private key, you can merely use that to log into your instance. I display that later for my own uh, key that I used to um, uh, create and had created before. Um, so one thing, in addition to creating a key and storing it and possibly converting it, I'll get back to it in a second. The other aspect you want to look at is network. And your network topology by default will be empty. There will be nothing in there. Um, but not in my instance, hopefully. So uh, not quite empty. You will only see the NTNU internal network. NTNU internal network is the one that is internet connected and kind of you know available to all instances in OpenStack in a way. What you will need to do on top of this, create your own network under here, under network. And uh, you can just follow the tutorial that I posted as well. Uh, I'll show that again. Uh, it's very straightforward. You just set a few parameters and say there's, um, yeah, so a um, bit of information about the network. And you create a router that is linked to that network. I guess you have more insight. When you create, you see quite a bit more. Let's see. So you can you can select hey this will actually be selected to the uh, link to the external network and to your internal so it kind of sounds weird but what it says basically you have your private network that only you and your instances can connect and interact with and over so it's completely separated initially and then you can say hey i want to link this via a router to the NTNU internal network so i then have internet access it's kind of something you want otherwise you don't have internet access again that's described in the in the in the tutorial is quite straightforward and once you actually run all this and link it up um you will see um you know you can go back to network topology just to validate it cross validate it and you see should see that form of infrastructure where you basically have your internal network that you created the existing anti new internal and this router linking both worlds and all your instances i'll show you in a bit will then be linked to your own network but should be accessible um by the public world so, so much about the, the networking um, bit for now. So the other aspect that I want to point to is security groups. What were security groups again? Uh, They're like firewall rules. So I think about like firewall rules. We talked about, you guys know about key addresses, you know about ports, right? So it's around 55,000 ports uh, more on your individual instances. Um, um, and they are usually by convention associated with particular services, right? We talked about this, right? What are some ports, you know? Just for recap quickly. What standard ports in for internet access? What are standard ports? 80 for what? HTTP, yeah, okay. What what's that again? 22 for SSH. 22 for SSH, very good, yeah. So every time you read 22 in there, it means SSH. Um, that's kind of the secure shell access, yeah. What else? 443. That's yeah, 443 for HTTPS, that's right. So all this, yeah, for, for? FTP. For FTP, yeah, for the control channel of FTP in particular, that's correct, yeah. FTP has multiple uh, links, one's for data, one's for control. Um, anything else? There's like, I don't remember, but I think about like 25,000 is like just open port. I think up to 4,000 is like, uh, it's like a uh, port reserve, I think something like that. I think the ANA only reserves technically until 1024, I think, and everything above is, is uh, free for all, but it's not because uh, there's a lot of conventionism as well, right? So for example, uh, Microsoft domains run on port 4,500 or something. Um, and uh, uh, MySQL, for example, which port does that run on? Correct. It's by convention, right? They just set it up. And then now everyone knows, well, yeah, that's my right of MySQL, but you know, don't use it for anything else. But there's no law or there's no you know, spec or you know, it's no enforcement per se. It's just convention in this range. But you had something else you wanted to mention. Yeah, I was going to say that there's like a range that are like 
be taken over by like big companies yeah. or like uh, software, like, like uh, you mentioned. That's correct. So there is, there is this conventionalism in this mid area and then yeah, above a uh, higher level, I guess, about 8,000 or something like this, then becomes very lean. And then people. 88 is a corporation. 88, yeah, but it's like, yeah, it's more like a convention as well, right? 4,443 is a corporation. Also? Yeah, three, three portions of. Ah, okay, interesting. Yeah, so, so there's quite a bit of convention in this range. Yeah. So the main point is there we have one node, one IP, or one or more IP addresses. For each IP addresses, multiple ports. 65,000, right? So you kind of want to manage what's actually can come in, what can go out in traffic. And that's again, as I mentioned before, it's kind of a separation of the rules for the network from the actual instances. So you don't configure on instance level, you configure on project level in the widest sense. So I've created one rule here, but I just create another one because it's fun. And um, by convention, the tutorial is a bit off in one, uh, um, the tutorial says that you should modify the existing default uh ooh, sorry, i'll just delete this one here right now just to be really like explicit so by default there will be one security group there and we can just have a look at the rule and uh you can't really delete that one as well which is kind of a i think we cannot it's probably a good idea anyway um and what basically says that uh you can uh, you have egress uh, traffic that's quite open and you have possibly ingress traffic um that's um in principle possible so it allows this uh, and it allows well, every protocol, any port range, and both for IPv6, so like the modern uh, IP uh, protocol, modern, I'm not sure if modern is the word of choice, um, IPv6 from 1998. Um, but um, so ingress means incoming, egress means outgoing, and they have different rules basically allowing the base traffic. But um, in order so, and then you can manage those and change those uh, by best. Practice is actually not to change the defaults group, but create new ones for what particular needs you actually have. So you would create some some other novel group that is dedicated to a service, so like let's say SSH here, or um, yeah, so SSH because the only one we can sensibly use without installing stuff right now. Um, and then basically ask, okay, what do you want me to do? And basically proposes, hey, you know, I, first of all, egress means outgoing direction. It says any traffic going out from whatever host is inside is permissible in IPv4 to any remote address. So basically anything goes outwards. For IPv6, the same, right? No incoming, there's no rule. And there's a default deny policy, basically says, if no rule, then deny, right? So uh, what we can do now is basically create an additional rule, so say add rule, and here you can be really specific about the kind of service you want to admit or allow in, right? So in some are pre-configured, um you know icmp tcp udp so this would be kind of um filtering on protocol on layer three level um with respect to the kind of you know, protocols that you're allowing um but also on application level for example http protocol https imap so email basically um microsoft sql mysql if you just click on this you'll see does it oh, it doesn't show me the port ranges so you know, pity. um and many others, right? For so POP3, RDP, remote desktop protocol, so for remote management of Windows machines in particular, and SMTP uh, for uh, mail services, outgoing ports, and so on. But also SSH. So if I click on this, um, I can just basically add this particular rule, and you should see that there is now a, a particular configuration that signals protocol and port. So you have now ingress, so allow incoming connections over IPv4 only over TCP, not UDP. You learned about the ISO OC stack, right? Remember that stuff? No? Okay, I'll do it after the break sometime. Do a bit of catch up on networking when needed. Um, and uh, on port 22, because that's SSH, right? So that's admissible. Cool. So with this way, uh, in this way, we basically now have our security group that's called SSH. So that's how we define different groups. And they just persist in your entire project quite nicely. So. The rest, uh, floating IPs, I mentioned already, you can separately manage floating IPs that have already been assigned, uh, but I'll show that in a bit. So what I want to do now briefly is just to spin up an instance to tie all those things up. Remember what you need to do. Well, you need to define a key pair. You want to kind of download, prepare already for usage. You want to create the network. 
And both of those things are things you only do once, right? You can then try afterwards create arbitrary number of instances that you link to network and using the key pair. But those are the kind of things you want to do first before you move to creating instances. And now I do this, launch instances. So what do we need to do? Um, first of all, we know about images, but we probably need to know a bit more. So let's say we have a, yeah, no, good. Demo instance, no, demo instance. So description, if you want, availability zone, uh, that's kind of the scope of availability that um, um, operates on that. There's only one zone here in, um, in our instance. And how many instances you can create multiple at the same time if you wanted to. And here, the next choice is then, okay, what do we actually want to boot from, right? So we have the different services. And I just mentioned before that um, Ubuntu, you know, 2004 LTS is probably the one you want. It's a public image. You can also, by the way, create your own images in there and keep them private. So you see this allocated now. Baseline image is actually quite slim with two gigabyte only, but it's pre-installed. There's all the important baseline things. So, and then the interesting bit starts. We never talked about configuring your actual machine, right? So you're processing and so on, right? So and you see that um, the uh, um, kind of instance types or um, characterizations are referred to as flavors in, uh, I think AWS uses the same term and here in OpenStack as well. And they're kind of summarized in this kind of short name form like T1, M1, C1, M1, and so on. So uh, and, yeah, of various forms. And they basically signal the rough ranges, you know, like if you think about, you know, Intel i5, i uh, three i7 or whatever categories in terms of performance similarly here they kind of group them based on the uh, kind of feature set that they have and what it usually means is the number of virtual cpus that are combined the ram you get and the disk that you get basically um uh, associated with this and you see you know in some instances say hey hang on that's not going to happen because you simply don't have enough you know resources for this for example i wouldn't be able to start a C tiny instance C being the biggest class i think that's available on OpenStack right now in our instance of OpenStack. Uh, configurations um, that uh, requires eight CPUs. Remember, we have three, uh, 16 gig of RAM. We have six and 40 uh, gig of RAM. And I think a uh, uh, disk that will be enough in this instance. I think we have only, sorry, I need to check that again. See if you get problems booting up an instance, but you shouldn't. But this one, for example, would not be possible. So everything in this territory down here, if we look at it, and there's quite a bit of juice here. So the um, R1 being the far largest is the 256 gigabyte uh, with 32 virtual CPUs. So you can actually spin up, you know, kind of a chunky uh, CPU if you wanted to there um, quite nicely. But let's stick to something smaller. So I generally would go like for a conservative, I'm either T1 large or M1 tiny. I think I'm going for the N1 tiny. I only need one CPU, but I favor RAM over CPU, for example. So then you basically just select um, the kind of configuration you you want so basically now we figured out what we want um here the networks it will automatically allocate any network it finds if you have uh, defined your network here um then it should be as allocated as well so here's this network my network that i created in uh, that basically links my uh, defines my internal network connectivity that is then ultimately linked to NTNU's internal network then we have network ports those are separate ports that bypass your network and link to the internal new internal network. We don't need those here. We just work with this standard approach. And then we get to security groups at the next point. Those are the interesting ones. So the default group is here, but um, I want to have the security group, um, the, sorry, the SSH group here. Basically, I, I define my firewall rules quite straightforward, right? So quite painlessly, so no configuration on the client side needed. The last thing I need is to have my, my, my key. So I get actually yes, get access. If you forget that step, you can't get access to your running instance. Uh, and that's also important that you need to actually copy your key and keep your key. The PEM file can only download once ever, and you need to keep it somehow. Right? That's the thing you need to keep. Um, but once you have it, then you're actually in a good um, situation to really quickly set up your authentication. And the rest you can just click through. What you can do is if you have multiple servers, you can group them topically. For example, you have five servers that are database services, two servers that are logic services or web servers or whatever. You can group them for easy uh, um, for easy management, you could say, you know, send commands to all those servers and things like that. So but we don't have this. Um, also, no preferential scheduling or any sort of further information that we need to inject. You can also uh, inject startup scripts. Um, I think that's that one here. Configuration. That's the customization script that you want the machine to run on startups. Pretty cool, actually, if you have that need or uh, want to do this. 
and that's easily scriptable in itself quite nicely. So what I'm doing is, of course, manually, but you can script all this kind of um, activity as well. And then you just basically just say load instance and wait for it. Hopefully it's reasonably quick. But in any case, it builds it. You see status here. It tells you what key is connected to it, the flavor and the initial internal IP address that you get associated. And this is the one from your own internal network, right? Based on the internal network that you create. Um, so it's not connected to your NTU internet uh, network in widest sense. So if we look at, so this is now the running instance, it's probably booting up, will take a while. But while it's doing it, let's look at the network topology to see how things tie up. So it's always important to look at the network topology if you get lost, and you realize, well, damn, I don't get connectivity or I can't connect to the instance. Um, so here, that's how it's set up. And so far, that looks actually um, quite um, good. So the instance connected to your local network, that is connected with the wire um, internal network of NTU. Ucor. So. so however, to make those instances accessible um, from the other way around, from NTNU inside, you also need to link it to an IP that is visible from the NTNU network. Because all the IPs, um, that, the ones that are signed here, 1000, uh, 10, 14, 109, and so on, they are assigned within your own network, so they're not visible to the outside network for good reasons. Think about your router uh, in your flat, right? And you're connected to the internet. You have a public IP visible from the internet, but all your internal IP is usually 192.168.0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 2, 254 for the router itself or whatever they're not accessible they're private right so but now we need to do it the other way around we actually need to get access to that stuff so how do we do it um well we need to associate a floating ip here and um this is not something you need to do in advance you do it once your machine is up but you can basically uh, associate an ip address that you already have so you get a you have a pool of floating ips that you can request one by one so for example you want to have three floating ips you can get up to 50 you can uh, you know keep those in your project the cool part is there even if you change an instance you can reuse the same ip again which is really useful for example for people like me who want to exchange the submission system at runtime and just keep the ip and just change the underlying machine so next time you log in you wouldn't notice that you're actually working on another instance because you're looking at the same uh, ip fundamentally so it's quite nice for uh, hosted services that you can reassign the ip without uh, you know if you manage migration of course uh, underlying in some other way and anyway so that's the, 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 the port to be associated. So you need to say which IP address is visible from the outside and what machine is to be or what instance is to be associated. It's only one right now. So it's relatively straightforward. And then you should see under IP address that there's also a um, floating IP address in addition to the um, main one. It takes a bit. So this is all happening on the networking node, by the way. So it needs to be reconfigured and linked up and so on. So now we have this public IP here, and that looks um, quite um, useful. OK, so now you have the running instance. The question is now, how do we access it? Um, and uh, yeah, so just talking about access for a bit. Um, I post some instruction in, in uh, wherever possible. So generally, um, here's the documentation. And again, I want you to walk through the uh, setting up for the first time using web interface, also linked from elsewhere. But now coming to my point of um, the, um, this is, uh, those are the instructions I would say you should attempt to, to, to run through in this particular order, roughly, like creating a key security group and then the instance and so on, but follow the guidelines as they laid out. This is actually kind of the order that is actually set up as well. Um, in, in the official guides, but that's not where I want to get it. Um, yes, I just want to talk about uh, authentication uh, briefly, right? So you guys are aware of SSH connectivity? Yes, you learned that somewhere, right? Asymmetric uh, encryption ideas, right? You have private key, public key, and therefore um, it, uh, the server can identify it's only you because you're only the, the only one uh, that can provide this private key in combination with which um, the, the unique secret is identifiable on the server side and client side. And passwords would be the old way of interacting, right? So you get username and password. That's just the bad way because passwords are reasonably comparatively short, right? So, and forgettable, hard to manage. You have username attached to it and so on. The idea is to have key files, and it's precisely this kind of PEM file you just downloaded. Um, and uh, they're more or less exclusively used in cloud environment, easier to manage. Right? You have multiple of them for different services. 
and uh, just way more secure. Because one of the key differences is here, um, we don't have this on OpenStack really, but if you put an instance out on AWS, you can give it minutes and people start going in for it. Right? Like you, you, if you check the logs actually on public hosted instances, uh, there's, if you have a really weak password and you really pull this off using a password, I don't know, give it 45 minutes, someone is in your system. So like, uh, you know, you need to be aware of this. You're not working in a sandbox anymore. You actually work on a live system. Not so much here again, we need VPN to get access even to our own instances. That is good. That's why I'm kind of favoring using it for our assignments because I don't want to see how that looks like on the public internet at least. Um, but um, something to be aware of. So keys is the key thing. So how do you connect? Two ways. Um, so you need to have the pen file that you download. It's number one. On Linux, quite straightforward. You literally have them somewhere in your file system, right? And you call ssh.i and then identify your pen file and you log in uh, using the URI um, Ubuntu at floating IP address. For, by default, all the images, because that would be your next question, what is the username? <laughs> have the default username Ubuntu, right? So that's kind of you're always pre-configured. You can expect this um uh, also on amazon images and so on uh, it's always ubuntu add for ubuntu images and um so that's the only thing you need to add uh, because basically the prefix basically means take the username as follows um, you could, in earlier instances or versions of uh, ssh you could even put the password in the ui which is super not a clever idea i mean like i don't know of people why but you know like yeah, yeah that was like the early earlier internet times where people were still a bit naive more naively thinking about it Okay, so um, that's quite straightforward. So in the pen files, I actually created for this. If you're using Windows, such as I do in this instance, uh, you need to do a bit more. There's a tutorial that allows you to, to um, convert those pen files into, uh, as I mentioned last time, into the PPK format, which is propri oh, not proprietary, but specific to PuTTY. PuTTY is the Windows uh, client for um, uh, SSH, which is a story that used. It's free, of course, and super, yeah, it's super 1980s, but it does its job, or 1990s, if you like. Um, so it's basically a console client. That's how it looks like. You have different images uh, and so on. But fundamentally, it does um, the, the same thing as I mentioned um, before. So you would, you would uh, have a username. I hope that is spelled right. So Ubuntu, then that's the IP address. Again, the IP address is the very floating IP address I took from here, port 22, because it's SSH. And uh, what I tend to do, I tend to run um, patent, uh, which is a tool. Hang on, let me go to SSH and show you. um you can either of course directly uh, link your private uh, key file for authentication right so and, and say hey that's the file to be used or you can use a, a, a more like a persistent agent um, that's running in the background let's see if i can bring this one up and you can load an arbitrary number of keys in here so that's the ssh key uh, that is um, loaded into this, this service on the web same website basically alongside putty and it uh, will just try out the different keys that are in there effectively doing sign up that's quite good if you have a large number of setups it's important that you uh, tick the box attempt authentication using pageant under the auth menu here okay let's go back to the session i entered my ip you can also save those sessions of course right if you want to persist this in order to make it easily accessible as i do here but fundamentally once you did it you should be able to make access what you get here see here my primary screen is uh, first of all, warning, security breach, because it has never seen that server before, right? So it says, hey, hey, hang on, there's this new machine right now. Uh, do you really want to, are you really sure you want to, you know, expose and connect to that machine? And of course, you are aware of this, but this is a warning of the first time only. It will then cache the fingerprint of that uh, um, USSH uh, connection and from there on not ask you anymore. But it's a good um, security precaution. But afterwards, what you get is basically a console window. And there you go. You have your full access to your machine. You see what resources we have it's indeed you probably read it better than i can we have two gigs of ram uh and uh, no cpu load on this i think top is a bit more informative when it comes to in cpu related information and more generally um yeah so it's not much uh, magic we can attend to right now so not much load on it and memory is a bit used but not really but you can do all the kind of stuff but you find though is often uh, first thing you want to do what's the first thing you want to do after 
Cool. That's right. Right? Because you need to, you want to expect that those images are outdated, right? So they will not, you know, every, every month have a look and updating the images. They'll probably do it every half a year, something like this, which is perfectly sensible. So you still your task basically to run app update and app upgrade first uh, to bring it up to the latest stage. There, say, you see 204 packages to be upgraded, so quite a bit. Uh, I'm not doing this right now, but that would be your exercise basically. And then you have your running instance and you can access it, right? So using uh, either PuTTY or otherwise. Um, uh, Linux quite straightforward directly in the Linux console. Um, yeah, so that's so much about um, this thing. So is that enough? Are we then sorted? You think you can run your assignment? Yeah? Okay. Any opposing views? I mean, evidently we have access from the outside, right? So that's, that's quite good. I'll be missing something. I'm just mucking around while you guys are thinking. Creating HTTP rule so to see in demo that we actually now have flexible access to services. So I'm creating a new security group, a dedicated firewall rule. And here's the cool bit. Uh, once you have those instances, you can dynamically assign it. So if you go to instances back, you have your instance there. So it comes up eventually. And here's this long menu you want to be really cautious about uh, where you can change things. You can edit security groups. You can also uh, remove the instance, shut it down. So hard control, if it doesn't react, that's where you go, you know, to shut it down, delete it or whatever else. I just attach the HTMP security group at runtime as well. So we're changing the firewall de facto, because what I wanted to check if whether we actually have um, also HTTP access. Ah, there you go, right? So that kind of works. I just installed uh, Nginx on this machine and basically open port 80, 80 uh, port 80, that's right. So you see that the deployment immediately works, right? So um, so now we have a running instance, but is that really enough? That is a catch question, of course. It's not the it's depends question you usually get. No, we are not. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is uh, we, we didn't talk about how to run services on, um, um, on, 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 on Ubuntu or on any machine, really. The problem is if you use SSH to run a service, basically, or uh, some ex run an executable, because most likely you would try to run your executable manually, right? And then it kind of works and you would log out and everyone is happy, right? So it turns out they are linked to the session you're creating it with, right? So if you're logging in as a user, Ubuntu Edge, blah, 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 you're creating and you're instantiating your Go uh, binary. As soon as you log out, that binary is killed as long as your session. Not good for a server, right? So for this instance, I just want to show you briefly a tool um, that you can use for this. And I know it's not, not the most handy one, but it's a super good tool to know, I think. Does anyone know Scream or has heard about Scream before? And not Scream, the movie. Do you guys still know that? Or is it something of the 90s? Ah, good, it's still this thing. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but not as much. Less. That's good. So now Scream, right? Like the screen, literally. And the idea is really that you actually can maintain the um, can can maintain the session um, uh, even if you're logging off. So you have a server, cool. You have server session party linking to server sounds good. Um, and we can have, of course multiple one right. So and there's a concept of term terminal multiplexing. So um, some of you may have heard Tmux 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 before. Tmux. Gorilla Max, you have certainly have heard. I've saw it in the assignment. But uh, Tmux actually terminal multiplexer. The idea is basically kind of similar there. The uh, idea is, okay, can we, from a given persistent network connection, you know, based on SSH that we actually hold, can we spawn off a screen session, kind of a virtual session of this multiplexer that emulates um, terminal behavior, but it's actually distinctively different, right? Runs on a different thread, basically. Think about it from a programmatic point of view. Um, 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 uh, compared to your SSH session. So the idea is then, okay, then you can actually cut, uh, you know, stop 
um, your session actually, your actual SSA session, and the screen, screen session, session should persist. That's basically the idea underlying it. That's where a screen comes in. Then you can come back in again, have a new session, session two, and you can link back and come back to this one. So you can run something in the session. You can also run multiple sessions, of course, um, and, and, and so on. You get, the, you get the gist, right? So it's not the, it doesn't solve all the problems that you uh, possibly might have. For example, if you are restarting the system, it will not restart all the sessions, for example. But that's fine. Um, but it's pretty good to actually run services when you are not, um, you don't want it manually, but you don't want to attend to it immediately. So that's the basic idea. There are various of those out. Screen is one of them. Tmux, the oldest one. BYO. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that, that thing. And um, so it's another one. Uh, but the screen is probably the most commonly used one. And it's pretty installed, pretty installed in um, Ubuntu. So. Just a few minutes back, we talked about open source and we talked about pain. And those are the things that actually come back to play here uh, because it's not entirely convenient to use, I must admit, but you get there. Um, so here's the thing. I wrote a bit of a um, tutorial, mini tutorial on the, um, on the wiki that allows you to get a bit of a go at it. it introduces the concept of a multiplexer of Chris very briefly again, but actually how to also tells you how to briefly put it in use. A bit of a, like, a, like, a, like a cheat sheet uh, at the bottom of how to get things uh, um, done in the first place. I'll see if I can demonstrate some aspects of it. So if you just um, run screen um, bluntly, you get first a bit of a copy, uh, copyright warning, all that magic, and you get back to your terminal. And you say, yeah, cool, I'm done, right? So um, I don't know, where's the screen thing anyway, right? So, um, and it looks like a normal kind of instance of everything else. But here you created an instance of, um, a, 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 you know, a screen instance, so a, a separate uh, session instance. Um, and your question will now be, okay, how, how do I get in and out and so on? And the command for getting out is control A, D, D for detach. That's the idea. It's written here, detach from session. So I just press this one and you hopefully see. Um, so, yes, that worked. Uh, you see that it said detach from da 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 da, right? So, um, so now you're back in the original session. So how does it work? Well, when you connect to SSH, Screen is a layer on top of this, basically, right? So you are connected to that particular session, which you then can detach or reattach from the underlying physical well, SSH connection. Let's think about it like a physical connection, but not really. But um, the screen connection, however, is internal to your machine only and persistent. So we're now deattached. So, and uh, I just want to reattach, for example, and uh, I just can say screen dot R, reattach me to the last session, which is still in here. Uh, sounds good. What can we do in here? Um, just run top in there persistently, right? So I, I disconnect again. So that sounds quite good. It's still running in the background. So now I'll um, go one step further. I actually close my entire session, right? So I I'm not longer connected to the machine. The server runs, um, well, on its own in a way. Question is now, you know, do we still get into the um, the session afterwards. So I do the same thing. I'm restarting my putty setup and so on, all that kind of business, hopefully get back in. Also don't get a security question anymore because I have accepted the um, particular SSE identifier. So, okay, um, what do we do now? Well, you know, the, what is running here anyway? Um, so this is coming up a fresh instance right now, right? So, but now we can check, screen is still running in the background. Let's see if we actually see it in top coming up. See right now, um, but we can list all the different sessions of screen that are still running. Screen dash ls. We we'll see, hang on, there's still one running, right? So one detached session is actually running in there, and we can just say screen reattach with dash r. There's only one session. It, it iterates an order of sessions basically. So if you have multiple, you can iterate, um, and you're back here, right? So we're now back in that session that I just um, um, disconnected from before. So you can persistently uh, maintain that info. Mation. So um, that's the idea. So disconnecting again and reconnecting again. I make it intentionally quite straightforward because you can deal with multiple sessions. You can name them, you can reference and attach to multiple sessions. So, for example, if you um, say screen dash s my session, so you create a new session. Now I'm deconnecting from it dynamically. Um, it's called my session. I say screen dash s. 
we see, oh, we have now two sessions. One of them is named, right? My session, the first one. And the second one was the other one from before. Now I'm able, of course, to select explicitly uh, the name session in particular, because uh, I don't want to type out the, the other bit there, but uh, my session should be picked up automatically. So I'm back in this particular instance of a session. Anyway, you don't need multiple of those, of course, as you will, as you will have guessed. Um, but in fact, if you want to leave the session, you just pay exit, like literally like leaving your Linux more or less, and you're now back in the original terminal, right? So a multiplexer is one level above your terminal, basically. Uh, and now we should have only one left. That's correct. And I'm reattaching and closing this one as well. So uh, saying quit and exit. So I'm back at my terminal. I say screen dot ls. There's nothing left, no sockets, nothing's found. So um, that's the idea. And what you will need to do for your assignment basically is to, uh, when you want to start it, just go into screen, start it in there, disconnect from, disattach from your screen instance, and then reattach to the instance again if you wanted to modify it or rerun it or whatever else. That makes sense. Or is it completely out of? Should be quite straightforward, right? Sounds painful at first, but you need to think about the abstraction there. So, is anyone oozing with confidence at doing this? Sorry? Is anyone oozing with confidence? No. Yeah, people didn't, never did it, so I mean, I'm not expecting any confidence, but you get the concept, right? No is an answer, yes an answer, close question, da, 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 that thing. So, I mean, that's, you know, here's the thing, easy. So, try it out. Connect to your, first of all, get your server running. Yay. That's the most important bit. So, um, and um, also, if you have some of issues, issue checker, right? So, just post. Perhaps it's a gotcha that you fell into or five of us fall into. It's always good to learn. Um, so, and then, you know, um, run something on there, like top or whatever. know or so a Go environment, or, um, and so on. <clears throat> uh, or ideally, yeah, run, run top and disconnect, and then reconnect again, you'll see that top has died, right? Because your instance of the connection, like the SS, uh, SSH connection would be, that, that, yeah, this one, will be gone. And therefore, everything that started on top of it is gone as well. So, but once you run screen, and then they are in run top, for example, they will continuously and persistently run. You can just reconnect using screen dash R, and disconnect using control A, D. <laughs> control A, because it's uh, not confused with most, most other commands. So not just control, because it's complex enough. So you because screen is basically overlaying an entire terminal, which may listen to control commands. So you use an intentionally complex command. So chances are that your program will not listen to control A, detach, right? And that will basically detach you from the session and reattach you afterwards. Anyway, have a go. If you get lost, um, then, you know, um, write it. Here's, again, as I mentioned, a complete, um, there's also links to external things, but it's quite a straightforward way of how to run it, including external resources. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Screen running a computer independent of the SSH station. Yeah. What happens if you turn on this? It will die. So the, 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 the screen session will not persist. Um, so the question was, uh, I just said, what's the chat question reading out? The question is, what, what happens if you turn off the PC, restart, and whatever else, and you have, still have a screen instance running, it will be gone. So it's not persistent in a, in a sense that it will run uh, or restart automatically, but it's only persisting for as long as the machine runs. The VM. Can you set up something that, uh, like, a, a in it? Just sure. The yeah, so that would be alternative setting up a local service, but I don't want you guys to go through that pain right now. So because you have enough, I want to give you a reasonably easy out for this instance. And then next iteration after break, we talk about Docker, which is kind of precisely for that purpose to manage kind of service on the server side autonomously, but also to kind of do the deployment automatically because I want you guys to be honest, to feel a bit of the inconvenience and pain of doing the actual deployment as well. Because that's all very manual right now. We kind of need to get it going in a way, right? So, um, but when with Docker, it will be a different game. So, but that's why we do it kind of manual. Screen is our helper here, please. So you are expecting us to, uh, when we uh, submit the assignment, to do it on this uh, entire new open stack thing. That's and correct. Run it and hope that it, the stack doesn't crash and you, the application is running, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, there's always been an element of hope. That's a good one. So uh, the question was basically whether I expect you to run this on OpenStack and uh, uh, hope that it's running and so on. Yes, but generally OpenStack runs very well. We get uh, actually service announcements if they're shutting it down or I have to restart it or maintain it. It's very unlikely. And guess what? Then in worst case, we need to all go in again, start our, you know, software again. And I think this should not be the, uh, you know, if that's an issue, then we'll should be able to sort it out by saying, hey, can you restart your instance and we're back on track. Yeah. Uh, why, why not like uh, Heroku or uh, anything else? Like for so only for learning. I want you guys to expose to different thing. You know, there's exploration, there's exploitation. Exploitation means doing what you know already. If you want to do what you know, you shouldn't don't need to go to university. But if you want to explore new stuff, get exposed, form opinions, critique, uh, then you need to try new new stuff. That's why I'm giving you new stuff all the time. It's just to expose. I'm happy if you say Firebase is the worst thing I ever dealt with, but all I wanted is you to have that reflection, right? So in the same year, like, you know, if you are in the future in a situation, how do I some, run something persistently on Linux and I don't want to install Docker, you kind of have one way of going in to say it's a pain. That's why I made this tutorial, because it's a pain, I promise you. Well, it's not, it's not that deadly, but that's, that's basically the idea there to kind of expose you to stuff, right? This is how things would have been done like 10, uh, let's say, 15 years ago, more or less, like, you know, you write, create the services that run persistently, use screen or something else. Nowadays, you use Docker, of course, right? But it's still good to know how to get actually started on this, right? So how do you bootstrap this whole uh, kind of IIS infrastructure? So it's one stepping um, stone in this direction. Yeah, so your uh, point is absolutely right. I want you guys to be exposed to it. Other questions or pains? One thing, so it's a bit of mucking around, but once you get the hang of it, it should be quite straightforward. This part, that the problem is not the terrible hard one. Um, on Wednesday, I briefly um, show perhaps win, S, win, win uh, SCP. Did you guys deal with this? Like FTP via SSH effectively, right? So there's this client on, on Windows. You can briefly show it if you're, if you're interested. Feel free to download this. Um, that makes your life actually quite uh, easy as well. What's the difference between uh, win SCP and uh, SF? The WinSCP is just a software. It uses SFTP. No, no, yeah, yeah, it's a client. I'll show you. It's just a, uh, uh, just a, just a, for the Windows people, a client here, basically, that, that makes things more or less inconvenient for you, or convenient, depending on your perspective. That thing. It's like an FTP client left and right, and you can create a different um, a session, right, that you can link to, to create a new session. And it basically does exactly what we just saw before. Let me see. Um, Create a new site, host name, uh, and it uses the username Ubuntu. See, is that correct? And let's just break our fingers. It asks the same thing. Hey, I never saw the server. Do you really want me to connect? And I said, yeah, sure. Again, I use this pageant service in the background, right? So it's very makes my life easy. And on the right side now, you see your server side um, folder structure, right? Your user Ubuntu, so in your home directory, you can do anything you want in there in this file as you do it with the user. So Generally, good idea is to copy this in the home directory and then navigate from there to do other things. And that's your local directory on the left side that you can source from, copy to, and so on, right? So you can drag stuff over, use F5, the classical uh, command structure. But it's one of many tools for this particular um, purpose. What's the question? Yeah, 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 do what you want. I don't know if FileZilla supports um, SFTP, but if it does, go for it. I mean, no one, I'm not tying to any of those two links. Like, well, not at all. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it supports it. I just don't know, FileZilla. Huh? Okay, when it does, go for it, no harm. I mean, I don't really care how you get the stuff onto the server, <laughs> as long as it runs on the server, right? That's the main point. Uh, it's open source. That's the only thing I can say. So, and that's usually my indicator that has been to some extent vetted, not necessarily by me, admittedly. Also, bear in mind you want to be kind of be, uh, um, um, check carefully that you're not using it from some obscure source, but you know something that's reasonably identifiable as the original page. I actually linked them, I think, from the main page, so you have the right URL, so you're not running at risk to get into some sketchy territory. Um, Screen or uh, open. Uh, no, 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 um, the Putty and um, um, WinSCP, hang on. If I haven't linked it yet, I will link it under our this uh, today's session. I think I linked it somewhere from God where it is right now. I need to look this up. I'll provide the proper links, uh, and I think it's in the slide set as well. Hang on. Just 
to be safe. But um, yeah, no worries. I'll provide all that. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Else we figured out on Wednesday what happens. Yeah, please. If I didn't manage to configure the key pair value, I'm going to delete anything and create again. Yeah. 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 I didn't get that. So do you, no one needs to stay. You can just go. If I didn't manage to configure correctly the key pair value, would I need to delete instance in the. If you. Uh, Correctly, what do you mean of correctly? So when we are like starting a new instance, we have an option to add a key pair value, right? Yeah. And uh, there was also an option to like use an existing one yeah. on my machine and it didn't work and now I got declined. And uh, I'm just wondering if I need to delete the instance and create it again, or is there any way to like, change in the running instance? So okay, the question is can I check uh, SSH key pairs in running deployed instances? Uh, you can possibly change if you access, but it's a pain and it's not, you can't inject it program, or at least not by default, inject it programmatically from the outside. So your choice, your only way of doing this is to create a new instance and then inject a new key. Because there is also the option to go to the console. Yes, that's right. Um, that's right. You actually can access the console. That's right. Uh, hang on. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, you won't get too far with that because the I think a password authentication is blocked in the standard image. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that's right. There's this console option as well. Um, yes, but to be honest, I've never used that. Um, I, I wouldn't know what the what the default password would be. I mean, uh, generally, you want to ensure that you get SSH connectivity. That's a standard way of interacting with this. And if you lose this, I think the only way, sensible way, is actually to recreate it and inject the right key. So getting the key right and uh, saving the key and something uh, persistently is really important so this key pairs good part is once you do it once you kind of have it for all instances if you want that's super convenient compared to having five thousand different usernames and passwords for five thousand instances right uh, of course there are conventions about security that say hey you shouldn't use on all instances but fundamentally it's very easy to spin up yet another one put it this way so um yeah do this with care and uh, ensure you save the pem file at least and then um, perhaps follow the instructions for the conversion that is um, here. It's actually a, a Stack Overflow uh, link, but it's a really good, um, I find it a really good tutorial, super straightforward, and um, basically tells you exactly what you need to do with screenshots and so on. Um, and yeah, got, get, gets me very far, and it also describes how to actually then use it. So yeah, don't hesitate to use it. look at that as well. Cool. I think I'll leave it at this. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. I'm here for a bit more.